Dysphagia is my career passion in speech pathology. I love to eat and I love all my patients to eat. And when we think about eating in terms of, especially in the U.S., it is so emotional. It's when we spend time with our families and our loved ones and our husbands and our kids, um, you know, a treat. We go for ice cream, dinner. We all get together to celebrate a birthday. Um, eating is so ingrained emotionally, socially, and such a huge part of um, quality of life. It, it's really important. And I want everyone to be able to, to have that, that opportunity. Let's see here. Oh, there it is. So our learner outcomes today, I'm going to quick move this out of my way. Uh, learner outcomes are learner will be able to describe basic swallow function and aspiration. We're going to talk about that. Be able to discuss aspects of feeding and dysphagia that may be impacted as progression of dementia or with progression of dementia. Learner will identify strategies to support oral intake for those persons with advanced dementia and also be able to recognize current literature recommendations regarding tube feeding with advanced dementia. My disclosures are I own a mobile fees company called Dacman um, Dysphagia Diagnostics, like the introduction talked about. I travel throughout North Dakota and Minnesota to do endoscopy a small camera down the nose. That way patients don't have to drive two hours to Fargo, Grand Forks, Minot um, to have things done, as well as their families can be present, their treating SLP can be present, those kind of things. So I'm also an assistant professor at the University of North Dakota in Communication Sciences and Disorders. Um, I teach a variety of graduate school courses. I teach motor speech, voice, and dysphagia or swallowing. And then I supervise students in the clinic where they get to see community clients um, for a variety of adult disorders pertaining to speech pathology. So I do also receive a salary from the university. So quick overview. Um, I know there's a wide variety of people on the Zoom in the class from families to students to people with 20 years experience. And so it's kind of tough to make a presentation to suit the needs for everybody. But just a quick overview that dementia really is an all umbrella term that covers many different types of, of disorders. And so Alzheimer's certainly being a big one, but also vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and so forth. We know Lewy body dementia is often prevalent with our Parkinson's patients as well. Um, but there can be a variety of different diagnoses with dementia being the umbrella or, or overlapping term. But dementia is, in general, the idea of loss of memory and other critical thinking skills that can interfere with our activities of daily living and our independence um, and so forth. So when we think about prevalence and impact of dementia, the World Health Organization, or WHO, um, is currently stating approximately 50 million people are living worldwide with dementia. And these numbers are projected to really increase. So by 2030, 82 million, and by 2050, you're looking at tripling the current number. Um, and we know that Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia and may contribute to 60 to 70% of the cases. And we also know that dementia is a leading cause of disability and um, poor health. So we're gonna start talking about dysphagia, just a basic overview. Um, I have the, the terminology that we use. However, I also have more of the layman terms, how we would talk to someone's um, family member or a student who's maybe not as familiar. Dysphagia, simply put, is the fancy word for swallowing. And so when we think of swallowing, we think from lips all the way to the gut. Um, when we think of feeding, that kind of falls into more of the OT domain of how can I get that food from the plate to my lips? And then from lips to the gut really falls into that dysphagia realm but it's a swallowing disorder involving the oral phase, meaning your mouth, 
how you chew the food, cognitive awareness of that food. Can you get that food into a nice ball or is it piecemeal residue all over your mouth? Um, how do you get that ball of food from the front to the back? We have to have some anterior, posterior, or oral transit to get it to the back of our throat to start the swallow. The pharynx is the fancy word for throat. I talk to families, when we think about the pharyngeal swallow, I try to explain it, think of a tube of toothpaste. We have all these muscles that constrict the pharynx or the throat and pull the food down. So kind of like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. Also with the pharynx, we have our larynx or the opening to our larynx. And this is where we have aspiration, penetration, things going into the lungs that we certainly don't want. Typically families have heard the term, it went down the wrong pipe. And that's exactly what it means. Our trachea is in front of our esophagus and it really is like a fork in the road with oftentimes liquid or food going down the wrong pipe into the trachea. So with the pharynx, if these muscles aren't pulling the food down, we're gonna have residue in here. Now we're done with the meal, but where is this residue gonna go? The path of least resistance is this open airway because our top of our esophagus is a closed sphincter. So our top of our esophagus only opens to swallow, burp, or throw up. Otherwise, it's closed. So the airway is nice and wide open, our esophagus is closed, path of least resistance for that residue is certainly into our lungs. Moving into the esophagus, the esophagus, like the pharynx, has muscles or peristalsis that move the food down. Um, this is certainly out of SLP's scope of practice to treat. We would never treat esophageal, but we need to be really aware of it because the esophagus can impact so many other parts of the swallow that often it falls to us then say, you know what, the throat swallow is great. Something's going on from here to the belly. We need to refer you to GI. Um, or, you know, you saw GI, they told you this, and then in layman's terms, here's your diagnosis. This is why it's coming back up into your throat. Or this is why you feel like it's sticking up here, but it's really down at chest level. So certainly we do a lot of the education, although we do not do the actual treatment. We need to be well-versed in the esophagus. So keeping in mind with this oral versus pharyngeal or mouth versus throat, um, we talk about volitional and reflexive. So the oral phase of swallow with adults, the chewing, the manipulation, the moving it front to back, getting a nice bolus, not having it everywhere in the mouth, that is what we call volitional. It does take a cognitive load to do that. We don't think about it because it's just so natural for us. But as dementia progresses, we know that affects cognition. And that's often when we see this oral holding a bolus. People put something in their mouth and then sit there for five, six, 10 minutes, or they take a drink and just hold it in their mouth. They're losing that volitional ability of the oral phase. Versus the pharynx or the throat is reflexive. And so if you think of a newborn, a newborn can get to mom's breast and protect its airway and swallow immediately. It's reflexive, meaning, we have sensory receptors in the back of our throat. And as that bolus gets there, it sends a signal to our brain. Our brain's like, hey, something's coming. Let's close up our throat and protect our airway. So those are two big factors to think about with, especially our dementia and our Parkinson's patient. The oral phase can be gravely impacted, but the pharyngeal phase can sometimes be still preserved. Not always, but, but sometimes. Um, and so we know that consequences of dysphagia can be malnutrition, dehydration, aspiration pneumonia, general health issues, chronic lung disease, um, you know, worst case scenario, choking, nobody wants choking, and possibly even death. There are some studies that after your first bout of aspiration pneumonia with the diagnosis of dementia, um, typically patients will pass within then six months. Um, you can certainly have intravenous and oral antibiotics, which clear up your lungs, but we know that if you're continuing to aspirate or have these other bodily 
degeneration of things, you're going to get another pneumonia, another pneumonia. And the more recurrent pneumonias you have, the less effective these antibiotics will become. And so it is known that aspiration pneumonia is the leading cause of death with those with um, dementia. You know, it's it's a tough, tough thing, thing to think about. However, it it's part of the, the natural death and dying process of this unfortunate progressive disease. Along with that, Patients with dementia and dysphagia also start to have disinterest. It's not enjoyable. It might be more work. Maybe they're coughing and they just want to avoid it altogether. Even in the mild stages, they're aware like, hey, in a restaurant, I've been coughing for 10, 15 minutes and I feel horrible and I'm embarrassed and I don't I don't want any more. Um, and it can certainly lead to isolation and reduced quality of life. We also know from literature, dysphagia increases caregiver cost and burden. It's really tough on that caregiver, um, especially if you have a patient on such a limited diet. There's a big association of guilt of, well, I'm eating real pasta, you know, fettuccine and chicken. And yes, you are too. And I blended it in a puree version. There's still a guilt factor um, that is quite um, prevalent. And as patients get into the more advanced dementia stages and reduced awareness. I think families do a little bit, a little bit better about having things that they enjoy, but certainly in the mild stages where people are still aware of like, why does yours look great? And mine looks like this. It, it's kind of tough, certainly. So besides the malnutrition and dehydration, the risks of dehydration is UTIs. With UTIs comes sepsis, which comes a hospitalization. And this whole just consistent downfall of issues. So really nutrition and hydration are quite important. And also with dehydration, you can have headaches, increased confusion. Um, we talked about UTIs, but even constipation, which then you just really don't feel good. So continuing on with dementia and dysphagia, this study looked at patients that were viewed clinically, clinically meaning as a speech pathologist, I come to your nursing home room, your hospital room, or you come to my outpatient clinic. I look at your cranial nerves. I look at your muscles. I look at how your mouth is sensing food and getting it from here to here, how much food's left in your mouth. And with a clinically valve, they're noticing 32 to 45 percent of Patients with dementia have dysphagia. But when we look at an instrumental assessment, meaning a fees or a video, and we'll get more into these in a few slides, that raises to 84 to 93%. That's a huge impact. Um, my soapbox of my career, I teach at university, I own a business in swallowing, is the need for instrumental evaluations. Um, I think it's getting better and better, especially in the last few years. But if someone broke their hip, you would never question an MRI. But yet people have re recurrent pneumonia and they're coughing at meals. Ah, you don't need an instrumental. The speech girl can just take a peek at you, put you on thick liquids, you're okay. And we really need to change the outcome of that because as we get into these case studies, with the instrumental eval, we were able to find some really good compensatory strategies for these people to consume um, a least restrictive diet and still be getting nutrition and hydration. We know that dysphagia is the biggest risk factor for mortality um, and um, can cause dehydration, nutrition, respiratory infections, and pneumonia. And we know that aspiration pneumonia is a common cause of death. So let's talk about those. This is this literature is um, compiled, but it's focusing on Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, not general dementia. Um, there's a little bit better statistics for Alzheimer's in terms of what's out there in the literature and giving us information. But with the typical progression of uh, dysphagia with Alzheimer's disease, Really, I think a lot of times we're not getting referrals for these patients until they're really severe and at the end stage. 
first is we know from all this literature, things are already starting to happen, even in the early stages. So depending on what study you look at, this can be anywhere from 32, so a third to 84%, over 80% of our, of our clients. And so we know at this early stage, we're starting to see appetite changes in, in almost half of the patients. Taste and smell dysfunction starts happening, and so foods might not be as appetizing or noticeable, these kind of things. These patients are starting to become more dependent on assistance for feeding. They might need verbal cues at this time. And in terms of the actual swallow, they're noticing delayed onset of the swallow, meaning instead of the bolus kind of reaching the back of your tongue and your brain saying, go ahead and swallow, now the bolus is going further and further before that brain kicks in that, that motor response for protecting your airway. We have reduced lingual movement, which means reduced tongue movement. And we also have reduced hyolaryngeal elevation, meaning the entire larynx moves up and forward which helps close our airway. So if we're not getting that up and forward motion, we're not able to close that laryngeal vestibule, we're leaving it open and that's how we can get food and liquid into the airway. Another thing that they found in the early stages is a decreased bold response. And if you're not familiar with a bold response, that means a blood oxygen dependent signal. Um, and this is detected in a functional MRI, and it can reflect changes in blood flow as well as oxygenation. Oh, I went too far. Let me get back. So Dr. Humbert did a study. She's a speech pathologist. She's left the field, but she was an amazing researcher. Um, one of her studies found that they're noticing these cortical changes at the pre and post central gyrus. And if you're familiar with the brain, that's our motor strip and our sensory strip, the biggest parts of our brain that help us do things. And so already at the mild stage of early Alzheimer's, we're noticing these, these changes in the brain. We're also, we'll move into moderate Alzheimer's these patients are starting to have more difficulty increasing their or meeting their nutritional needs. Um, they might also start wandering at this time. And with the wandering, we're actually having more of a calorie burn. We actually are expending more energy than we had previously because of the wandering around the home, the memory unit, the, the nursing home, wherever the patient may be. Um, so you might actually need more calories if your loved one continues to be ambulatory. We're also noticing changes in the autonomic nervous system. So we're having decreased saliva function and the start of esophageal dysfunction or disorders. Unless you're really in the swallowing world, people don't realize the importance of saliva. Saliva has enzymes that actually start to break down the food in your mouth before it even starts to be swallowed. And so saliva is very, very important to break down the foods, form a cohesive bolus, and get it moving down. Um, the patients we see a lot of this dysfunction with is our head and neck cancer patients. After radiation, they certainly have a, I mean, their saliva is oftentimes zapped and they have none, which is very, almost unbearable. Um, but we know that it happens with our Alzheimer's and dementia patients. And then often a lot of our patients have medications that are drying and they have that xerostomia. Um, xerostomia is a fancy word for dry mouth. And to be honest, I did head and neck with ENT and oncology for years. And it's the number one thing people would always talk about, like, oh, my mouth is so dry. It's so miserable. And I couldn't get it. Like, I'm like, yeah, I mean you know, you told me 50 times, like, how is this, you know, so, so awful. And to be honest, I'm on a medication and it drives me crazy. I have to brush my teeth five, six times a day. And I'm still, I mean, I'm kind of old, but I'm not like super old yet. We're like, this is really uncomfortable. So unless you know that feeling, it's hard to really get it. But um, speaking from experience, that dry mouth and reduced saliva is, is not fun. But certainly that can be playing into effect with our patients in eating as well. 
Also at the moderate levels, we're really seeing more cognitive and behavioral changes. So for example, we're gonna have a higher degree of distractibility. This is where we're starting to see that refusal of food. They also may be developing some food texture aversions of, um, they just don't like that sensation anymore. And so things that are have multiple consistencies. And so maybe they do great like on a vanilla yogurt, but if you give the one with the blueberries and now they have to kind of be like, well, what's this in here? And, you know, they spit it out. So sometimes those multi-texture things are difficult. Um, we know that as taste is decreasing, the taste buds that remain the most active is the ones that like sweets. Um, and so we know that our patients really like tend to gravitate to the desserts and the sweets and the candies. And, um, you know, certainly our nutritionists can kind of help out with that. But then I mean, if my grandma's 93 and she wants to eat cake three days a week, so be it. You know, like, it's okay. Um, again, you do need nutrition for wound healing and all these other factors, but maybe we let our elderly patients have a little more sweets in there. Also with this, we're starting to see, um, in terms of the mouth and throat or oral pharyngeal deficits, that prolonged bolus prep. And so they chewed the cookie, but yet... They keep manipulating, chewing it, chewing it, chewing it, chewing it. You're like, oh, let me see. And they open their mouth and it's just scattered everywhere. They just can't figure out how to get all that residue and move it into a nice bolus or ball um, that we need to do. We're starting to have more penetration or liquids or food into the larynx. And then aspiration is when it actually goes below the vocal cords. Um, also with these patients, they're starting to have more tunnel vision. And so instead of they're losing periphery and you almost get into more tunnel. So that can certainly affect, you know, maybe they love chocolate milk and they truly just don't see it. Um, it can certainly affect a wide variety of activities of daily living. So you might need to actually hand them that toothbrush and that toothpaste. They may truly not, um, see it. And so that's something to really kind of consider as well. And our OT friends are much better at vision than speech pathology, so I'll refer to them in terms of vision. But even as speech, as physician, as caregivers, we have to be mindful of like, oh, what, what is their vision like right now? We know it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as the disease progresses. So I pulled this. This is from Kodak Lens Vision, but this is just kind of a you know, a, a visual of what tunnel vision may look like. So you're seeing the center, but you're missing all this periphery. I'm gonna take a quick drink here, been talking too much. Moving into the severe Alzheimer's stage with dysphagia, now we're looking at 84 to 93% of our clients are really struggling with the swallowing. We know the cognitive and behavioral changes are more severe, that visual field continues to shrink. And this is where really we're starting to lose the communication ability. And so versus I'm thirsty, can you grab me some water? You know, we're losing that ability. Um, as well as now behaviors, refusals can be more and more and more. Um, I've always taught my students and it worked like a charm for me the 20 years I was in acute care and rehab. Instead of saying, hey, do you want some orange juice? Because the answer nine times out of 10 is no. Versus walking in, here's that orange juice you asked for. Oh, okay. Like just, you know, it's not lying, but it's still a little bit more engaging of like, but you told me you wanted this. And it's oftentimes, you know, as humans, we, we want to please our loved ones and we want to you know, please people. So like, okay, I'll drink your juice. Um, another thing that really worked for me at the rehab is, you know, I'm done. I don't want any more, move the tray away for, you know, five minutes, visit, do something different. And then, oh, your lunch is here. And we can essentially start over. Um, again, is it manipulation or is it a, a strategy to get some more intake? Um, it really does work like a charm, especially the, but you asked me for this ice cream. You 
you told me you wanted chocolate milk. Okay. And, you know, they'll start drinking it. Um, we know that now meeting the nutritional needs is getting harder and harder and harder. And so one thing I don't think a lot of providers are aware of is limb and limb meaning arm and oral meaning mouth apraxia. Apraxia is the fancy word for motor sequencing. So your brain sends out a signal like, hey, you know, pick up here, I'll put my water here, you know, pick up this water. So your brain says it, pick up your water. But somehow that signal gets kinked out or hijacked and your arm goes way over here. Or you want to say cat, it sends a signal to make the k, uh, t, but all of a sudden you say mat, you know. So I explain it to families of, let's say you want to turn on your windshield wipers and you hit the windshield wipers, but instead of the windshield wipers, the blinker turns on. So you're getting a motor response, but it's not the intended response. And so that's what apraxia is. And so what you'll see in my experience is if you kind of leave people alone, they do much better, especially with handheld foods. The spoons with the oral apraxia, you know, they can be upside down and they just can't motor plan it to turn it back around. Or you'll see people, maybe they have a fruit cup and they're drinking it. They know they wanted to take the spoon, but their hand kind of went a different direction. They had this limb apraxia. Um, so self-feeding, certainly um, the limb apraxia and the oral apraxia can be a big thing, as well as people continuing to refuse oral intake, no interest, poor appetite. They could be constipated and have a bellyache, um, variety of things, but they're just declining and refusing. We also know at this phase that oral prep or that oral stage of swallow is significantly impact. This is where we see, um, you know, an hour long meal, an hour and a half long meal. And I talk to families and nurses at a nursing home, CNAs, of per literature, meals shouldn't be more than 30 minutes. If they are, we're expending more energy than we're really even taking in. And so with our elderly population, we want to keep that to 30 minutes. And so, you know, if French fries take forever and they really want French fries, then let's supplement that with an applesauce and a tomato soup that we can get in a little bit quicker. So it's not like we have to take everything away, but we also want to be getting more calories in in that half an hour. So calorie dense. So everything that we as women have avoided our whole lives for extra calories, like ranch dressing and whatever that's high calorie, little tiny bit, peanut butter, we can be adding this in. You know, you can add 200 calories by adding some butter and cream to their already made mashed potatoes. You can throw in two tablespoons of peanut butter and add in 300 calories to, to a shake. You know, protein powder is popular these days, but how can we meet nutritional needs and get the biggest bang for our buck while they're kind of saying, no, thanks, I don't really... I don't really want that. Typically at this time, oftentimes people are um, feeding dependent, meaning they have to be fed. Families certainly do a little bit better. Um, you know, nursing homes and rehabs and hospitals, it's no secret they're understaffed. They've been understaffed before COVID and it's been worse since, since COVID. So you have a CNA truly trying her best, trying to feed three people. And so... You know, either the person says no twice and they're like, well, they said no, or we're feeding them so quickly that we're actually making it worse and we're causing more issues. And so when families are available, that's great. I understand families can't be available all the time. I certainly couldn't be there. I mean, I, I work all the time. I certainly could not feed my dad at a nursing home more than once or twice a week, to be honest. So certainly those kind of things we need to be mindful of. Um, those, so yes. Um, and then, oh, we're going to talk about a study that talks about oral cares here in a second as well. But one complication risk, especially at this stage is a lot of times, just like they're refusing, um, oral intake, they're refusing teeth brushing. Now we get a little bit of a pass if they have dentures and we can get them out and brush them ourselves. But we have all this bacteria in the biodome of our mouth that 
if aspirated, it's that bacteria in our mouth that goes into our lungs that is way worse for our lungs than the actual water or the actual applesauce. And so we're going to talk a little bit about oral cares here in a minute, but this is huge. And it has been for the last couple of years, but I think it kind of gets by the wayside when people are busy. Um, there was one study, this was years ago, but it started in Michigan. They made it mandatory. Every single person had to brush their teeth twice a day manually with a toothbrush. We get a little bit nervous when someone's like on a modified diet or a little bit less coherent. Oh, what if they aspirate the water in the toothpaste? Well, really aspirating a little water in a toothpaste is actually statistically better than the billions of bacteria in, in our mouth. And so how can we make it safe, but yet we have to be getting it done? So things to think about. But this Michigan hospital made it mandatory that people coming in for surgeries have to brush your teeth twice a day. And they had a 90% reduction in vent associated pneumonias. So not aspiration pneumonias, but just hospital acquired vent, you know, huge. And we're really, really seeing all this literature the last few years really talk about the oral care and the huge, huge factor it has on our health. So really quickly, I wanna to read to you the American Geriatric Society Feeding Tubes in Advanced Dementia Physician Statement. And so I have the highlights there and I'll read you the actual statement. So their statement is, when eating difficulties arise and feeding tubes, when eating difficulty arise, I'm gonna to have to close these pictures because I can't see everything. When eating difficulties arise, feeding tubes are not recommended for older adults with advanced dementia. Careful hand feeding should be offered because hand feeding has been shown to be as good as tube feeding for the outcomes of death, aspiration pneumonia, functional status, and comfort. Moreover, tube feeding is associated with agitation, Agitation requires greater use of physical and chemical restraints, chemical restraints meaning um, sedatives or medications to reduce behaviors. Um, they also have more likelihood to develop new pressure ulcers and efforts to enhance oral feeding by altering the environment and creating patient-centered approaches to feeding should be part of the usual care for older adults with advanced dementia. So when we look at pneumonia risk factors, this study looks at the risk factors and the biggest ones are oral hygiene, loss of consciousness, meaning we're not appropriately alert at that mealtime and we're still getting hand fed as well as dysphagia. And the other ones that we always kind of have in the back of our mind of, you know, is this increasing our risk? They're saying physical restraint, mobility impairment, and other dementia-related difficulty in ADLs, meaning feeding self and oral cares, shows a weaker, non-significant association with the development of pneumonia. So a weaker causation. So really pushing us, we really need to be on top of these oral cares. So this is by Dr. Langmore. And so it's a side-by-side -side of two different instrumental evals. We talked a little bit about clinicals. And I always kind of talk to my students and coworkers when they're like, well, they coughed. I think what's going on. I'm like, oh, you have x-ray vision because I don't. Um, so many factors can be going on that we really don't know. We really do need instrumental. My take on it is if you're going to modify a diet or pick up a patient for therapy, you need to have an instrumental evaluation to know what and why you're treating. It follows back into if you broke your hip, no one's questioning an MRI, but yet as clinicians were told, especially in the smaller rural communities, well, just, just pick them up for therapy, just do some exercises. Well, I don't, I don't know what exercises to do. So this is Dr. Langmore, and you'll see. Follow it yet. This is going to be a side by side. The All video right, part hasn't on. popped up yet. On. It's on the left. Okay, it's this is the apple sauce again. Five seeds. Go ahead. With the camera here. Go ahead and swallow. 
this is happening in the same exact moment. Okay. So we saw the food come through the throat. Nothing. Okay. Went now we go away. back to the thin liquid we again. We saw the food go through the and pharynx. Nothing in the airway. Okay. Don't so swallow it. Some advantages it. of the Hold video: it. you can see on. the top right, of the swallow it. This esophagus. is the milk, thin liquid again. You can again. see the bolus prep. You can I've see a little bit what they're liquid. doing in the mouth a little bit better. Some disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Of the fluoro, all right. To your patient to now, bread, one bite if bread you're and cheese. In a hospital, you have to get them in the elevator out of ICU. And, then, and if you're two hours away right. from a town that has videos, Whoop. you Can have you to transport that? them to, to some radio. bread and cheese. Fluoro. I'm going to pause this because she keeps talking. Um, Swallow it yet. So, with the fees, what right, I love about on. these, and I'm trained Hold in both, on. and I love both. Okay, this is but the apple sauce these, again. If you have any concerns with secretion, vocal fold mobility, um, you know, if you were crushing polyps, nodules, cancer, if you needed okay, eyes now on the go back to the these thin liquid again. That. And also, and if a patient's fed in bed or in a special chair, okay, you don't want to see them it. in that. Hold it. Go um, on. All right, swallow it. This is the milk. You want to see them how they're again. eating versus now I took I've them into fluoro them and I had to position them to see their neck, but yet they're never going to All right. sit that way at the moment. Now. But the platinum standard of those really should be access to both, meaning the facility should be able to look at the patient's history, talk to the doctor, talk to the speech pathologist. And then as a team, you know what, I have more concerns. Are the vocal cords closing? What's going on here? You I wonder if they have a zincers or a stricture, then maybe we need to go to fluoro. Um, but certainly the platinum standard is really having access to both. So now what, right? So we're painting a pretty grim picture of advanced dementia and, and dysphagia, but really there's a lot of literature to support us. So I think SLPs are very quick to modify diets. Um, we know the oral phase is greatly affected as cognition is reduced. We know we need a cognitive load to be aware of what's going on in the mouth. But a lot of times, if we're willing, a larger bolus or a weighted bolus gives more sensory input, like, right? Instead of giving these little bird bites, if we give a bigger bite, there's more surface area sending signals to the brain that people might do a little bit better. And surprisingly, We've had great success with, you know, cookies and ground hamburger and scrambled eggs. More textured items in the mouth, again, is giving more sensory input to that brain to be like, oh, I got something going on. Let me let me go ahead and get that that moved. And again, you don't know until you try. But we know that diet modifications can affect quality of life, can affect dehydration and malnutrition. And when we think about thickening liquids, if you're going to aspirate both, you certainly want don't want to be aspirating the thickening agents in the thickened liquids, right? Those are very harmful to the lungs. And so we really need to be thinking outside the box and looking at the patient as a whole versus, oops, they aspirated. So this study by Dr. Langmore, it's super old, it's from 1998. I, it's a hallmark for anyone in the speech pathology dysphagia world. This study looked at what really are the predictors of aspiration pneumonia. And so look at all the risk factors before dysphagia. So the number one risk factor is dependence on feeding. Okay, so we know in advanced dementia, we are now needing assist with feeding. Dependence on oral cares, yep, right? Tube feeding, hopefully our advanced dementia don't have tube feeds, but some might. More than one medical diagnosis, and the medical diagnoses that, that are really um, statistically at risk would be your strokes, any neurological degenerative disease, you know, Parkinson's, ALS, dementia, Alzheimer's, and then COPD, congestive heart failure, and GI issues. And there's a study that says if you have a dual diagnosis of COPD plus GERD, you're at a 50% greater risk of pneumonia. 
And so oftentimes if my patients have GERD and COPD and they're aspirating and it's a small amount and they feel it and they cough, I'll put a little asterisk in there and like statistically, they're at a much greater chance of aspiration pneumonia development because of these dual diagnoses than the little itty bits of aspiration. And so you really want to keep up with current literature of, and this isn't even current, it's 25 years old, but not getting away from, oh, say aspirated, done. You know, we have to look really at the big picture. And so in terms of options to total assist for drinking, I think this slide's out of order, but we'll just do it. Um, we know that the number one risk factor is being fed, right? So when we think about cup drinking, someone just kind of pours it in your mouth and that patient has no motor planning of how much is it? When do I swallow? When are they gonna stop? And that's when we really see patients get into trouble. So if they can coordinate straw drinking, even if it takes a couple attempts to get it coordinated, I always push for that. That way they're in control of pulling up the bolus, how much of the bolus, the timing, their motor planning, and they're usually much more successful. Oftentimes patients take too big of a drink. And so they do have things called metered straws and meter, metered cups, meaning you can only get one drink and until you let it go, you're not gonna get another. So you could sit like this, but you're only getting that one drink. This cup is called a Proveil and it comes in two different sizes five mil and 10 mil, five mil is a teaspoon and 10 mil is a soup spoon. So if they're managing the 10 mil, I would always push for that. Otherwise you're taking little baby sips and you know, your nutrition and time of getting it in is gonna be quite lengthy. Um, but just for kind of reference, a normal drink, like if I take a drink for my water is about 20 mil or five teaspoons and four teaspoons, I have to learn math. So by kind of reducing that, we might see some better outcomes as well. This is a big thing in the speech world right now, the three pillars of pneumonia, it's by um, Dr. John Ashford. He's out of Vanderbilt in Nashville. And so he took all these other studies, pulled them together and his big kind of platform is Hey, to really have aspiration pneumonia, you really need three factors. You need to have um, poor immune system or frailty. You have to be aspirating and you really need poor oral cares or a really bad oral bacteria load, right? And so he kind of came up with this risk predictor and really statistically to have a high risk of pneumonia, you really need all three. So if you only have one, you're really looking at, oh, I, I can maybe manage this. You know, even getting into two, if you're aspirating and you're frail, you, you're certainly at risk, but it's a lower risk. And so I think, again, really educating our medical professionals, our families of like, Yes, they are aspirating, but they've never had pneumonia. Let's try to have them aspirate less and keep going with it for adequate nutrition, hydration, as well as quality of life. Sorry, I know I'm running out of time. I'll kind of hurry up. Um, in terms of oral care, it can be kind of hard to help our patients with this. And so some simple tips would be simply the watch me method, doing it with them as well as breaking it down step by step. Like let's just even pick up the toothbrush. Instead of pick up the toothbrush, put the toothpaste on, make sure you get the back teeth, step by step slowly. But they're really doing that watch me method is really um, a little bit more beneficial. In terms of oral cares, um, children's toothbrushes may be softer if people have more of an inversion. And some studies say that oral toothbrushes or um, electric toothbrushes can be more distracting. If tolerating, they're so much better. You don't have to have the $100 Sonic Care, even the $15 one from Target. It just gets the plaque better. It cleans your mouth better. It gets the bacteria away. 
And then really trying to have them swish and spit with a Listerine. And Listerine can be very, it does not be Listerine, but any sort of mouthwash um, can be very harsh. You can dilute it and it still can be effective. So I have this study that I'm going to skip over because I know we're running out of time and I want to do a really quick case study. But you can look at this. Um, it broke down, it looked at five different things in mealtime interventions. And maybe Kara from OT is going to talk a little bit about this, but you can certainly look this up on your own. Um, the thing that they're finding the most is dining partners. So staff or family modeling like, oh, here's my bite, here's your bite, but like eating with them versus just parking them at the table and expecting them to do everything their own. And then adapting your environment, you know, having bright plates, having adaptive feeding equipment, again, that falls into OT's realm, but certainly a speech we can say, oh, that's not going well, you know, let's refer you to OT and see what's, what's going better. This is one kit by Eat Well. It runs about 98 for the whole kit. Certainly not saying to spend $98. Um, but things to consider, you know, handles with a mug. This has a larger base. It's harder to spill. These bright colors, you can actually see the food versus this, whatever this white food is on a white plate. Um, these little holes here are actually to tuck in a cover-up. We try not to say bib because that's not age appropriate, but a towel or a cover-up. It can tuck in and then you have this nice little net to kind of catch any food. We always want people to feel um, dignity and not be full of food or, you know, looking like we wouldn't want them to look at. Do we need to stop or do we have time for to, a quick case study? I know the next one stops at one, but should we should we stop and they can have a. You know, I think if you have time for a quick case study and then we'll take just a short break and then we'll start again at one. That'd be okay. Great. I'm so sorry. I, I was worried I wouldn't have enough to talk about. And now here I am. <laughs> this is great information. So okay. go ahead and finish up here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be really fast. So this patient lives at home with her husband. They do have a paid caregiver comes in five days a week. She is dependent on everything. Someone feeds her. Someone does her oral care. Someone changes her. Someone moves her. She does not even itch her face. She is dependent, nonverbal, but she does watch people with her eyes. And when we try to um, feed her, she does volitionally open up her mouth and accept the bowl. It's like purses her lips to take it off the spoon. So it's not like they're just dumping food in her mouth. Um, husband and team noticing coughing and husband's very um, aware of the progression and he is not at all interested in a tube feeding which we know is typically not recommended so we do a study on her and what we find is i'll show you some pictures here with the applesauce she had great clearance right it took her a while in the mouth but once she triggered the swallow look at how clear her airway is like it's fine now with the thicker liquid she has a pre-spill, meaning it falls over the back of her tongue before she initiates that swallow. So here you can see that thicker liquid's being aspirated before she's even swallowed. With the thin, her vocal cords actually adduct and it holds it here. And when she does have a little bit of aspiration, she has a great cough. But when she aspirates this thicker stuff, it's silent. And when we give her a smaller bolus, she actually doesn't even aspirate. So what do we do with her? When we look at her as a whole, her positive prognostic indicators, she has a good cough to aspiration, so she's clearing a lot of it. She's edentulous, so we don't have any decayed dentition that we know affect aspiration pneumonia. She's not on supplemental oxygen, and she's readily participating. Her risk factors are she has that diagnosis of dementia, puts her at higher risk. She's completely dependent on everything, puts her at higher risk. She has a dual diagnosis of GERD and CPD, again, higher risk. And we know from this study from Dr. Miles, people, again, this goes to serve the clinical, not doing clinicals and making it an end all. She found that people cough when they aspirate thin but silently aspirate nectar, which is exactly what we found in this patient. So if I saw her clinically, I'd say, oh, 
she's coughing on thin, she's not coughing on nectar, let's just put her on nectar. Again, why we have to have eyes on what's going on to treat appropriately. And we know from this study by Leader and Suter, they're from the speech world as well, they found that if you can't answer basic orientation questions, such as what's your name, where are you, and what year is it, you're at 31% greater risk of aspiration. And if you cannot follow basic directions, such as open your mouth, stick out your tongue, and smile, you're at risk of 58% greater risk of aspiration if you can't do that um, as well. So what do we do with her? We put her on a period diet with thin liquids. We trained caregivers of a slower rate, and she actually did better with a larger bolus. So instead of these little tiny half teaspoons, a heaping teaspoon, she's getting four times the amount in the same amount of time, and she has more sensory awareness, and that oral phase is actually better. We got her a metered cup that only goes one drink, so she's not having an over large amount or bigger bolus. Doesn't eliminate aspiration, but it does reduce the risk. And we know she has a cough. That's good. We talked about small frequent snacks versus meals and really looking at calorie dense options that we kind of already talked about. So really quick, um, this mist from Kansas City, I can send you an updated PowerPoint if you want. But I love this miss from Kansas City because as caregivers, we're so tender hearted of like, oh, without nutrition, they're suffering. Dehydration causes suffering. And there's all these studies to tell us really it doesn't. And actually tube feeding in the dying process, tube feeding actually can cause more issues because we can't digest it and we can't manage it. And there's literature to say tube feeding really doesn't even present prevent pneumonia long-term because you're still at risk of aspirin secretions, reflux, and those kind of things. Advice to families. Um, the big thing is oftentimes people are actually quite turned off by a huge plate of food. So if you can amp, just option, you know, one small option at a time, people are more willing to take it. Getting them away from the bedroom, you know, bright plates, a better table, some good lighting, some music, those kind of things. And if anything you learn today, no means no with our advanced dementia patients, never force feed. Like I've seen families like, well, this is how I do it. And it's like, no, like uh, this means no. Clamping my mouth means no. Turning my head away from you means no. Even if we had advanced dementia and we're nonverbal, we're still telling you no and to please, please, please never force you. So 